بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we have n i i d standard gaussian random variables x1 x2 2 xn we are interested in the expectation of the maximum of those n random variables specifically we want to show that the expectation of the maximum divided by the square root of 2 log n this ratio tends to 1 as n tends to infinity to prove this limit statement we need upper and lower bounds on the expectation let's denote the maximum by omega n and n is an integer that is greater than or equal to 2. Let's start by obtaining an upper bound on the expectation of the maximum. Consider e to the power rho times the expectation of the maximum. Rho is a positive real number. We can apply Jensen's inequality. If we have a function g that is convex, then by Jensen inequality, g of the expectation of random variable z is less than or equal to the expectation of g of z. The convex function that we have is the exponential function. By applying Jensen's inequality, e to the rho times the expectation of omega n, which is the maximum, is less than or equal to the expectation applied to the exponential function. Here we have the expectation of e to the rho omega n. e to the rho omega n is upper bounded by the sum k from 1 to n e to the rho xk. This summation here is e to the rho x1 plus e to the rho x2 all the way to e to the rho xn. Here we have just one of those positive terms the term that includes the maximum of the x random variables. But here we have the sum. We are upper bounding the maximum term by the sum. The expectation of e to the rho times the maximum of the n random variables is less than or equal to the expectation of the sum of the exponentials. This sum involves all n random variables that we have in our set. The random variables are i, i, d. Expectation is linear. Expectation of the sum is sum of expectations. So this is equal to summation k from 1 to n, the expectation of e to the power rho x k. But the random variables are identically distributed. This expectation is exactly the same for every random variable x k, k from 1 to n. This summation here can be written as n times the expectation of e to the rho x1. This expectation here is the moment generating function of the random variable x1. The moment generating function of a Gaussian random variable with mean mu and variance sigma squared is e to the rho mu plus one half rho squared sigma squared. Because x1 is a standard Gaussian random variable, mu is equal to zero in our case, and sigma squared is equal to one. So this expectation here is e to the one half rho squared. Applying Jensen inequality, followed by upper bounding the maximum term by the sum of all the terms, these two upper bounding steps give us the inequality e to the rho expectation omega n less than or equal to n times e to the power one half rho squared. We can take the natural logarithm of both sides to obtain that rho times the expectation of omega n is less than or equal to the natural logarithm of n plus half rho squared. Rho is a positive real number. We can divide both sides of the inequality by rho to obtain that the expectation of omega n is less than or equal to log n divided by rho plus rho over 2. We now have an upper bound on the expectation of omega n, which is the maximum of those n i i d standard Gaussian random variables. Note that every step that we have done here is valid for any positive rho. This upper bound is for every rho that is strictly positive. It is a good idea to obtain the tightest upper bound, the least upper bound, by minimizing the right-hand side with respect to rho. Note that if n is greater than or equal to 2, these two terms are strictly positive. If we apply the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality, then the sum of these two positive terms is greater than or equal to 2 times the geometric mean, which is the square root of the product. If we multiply these two terms together, rho disappears and we get log n divided by 2 under the square root. This summation here is lower bounded by the square root of 2 log n. And as we can see, the lower bound is independent of rho. Is this lower bound achievable? Yes, because the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality is satisfied with a strict equality if these two terms are equal. And if we equate them, we get that the value of rho that minimizes this upper bound on the expectation of omega n is the square root of 2 log n. The least upper bound, the tightest upper bound, is the square root of 2 log n. Let's recall our goal. Our goal is to show that the expectation divided by the square root of 2 log n is equal to 1. What we have here, if we divide both sides by the square root of 2 log n, is that this ratio is less than or equal to 1.
which means that if we take the limit of both sides as n tends to infinity, the limit is less than or equal to 1. But we want to show that the limit is exactly equal to 1. To be able to complete the proof, we will need a lower bound on the expectation of the maximum. Let's consider the positive real number C that is strictly less than 2. The expectation of the maximum can be split into three expectations because omega n can be strictly greater than the square root of C log n, or it can be between 0 and the square root of C log n, or it can be less than 0. These are the possibilities of the maximum. What we have done here is to write down this expectation as the expectation of omega n times 1. Then this one is written down as the sum of three indicators. In one indicator, omega n is less than 0. In another, omega n is between 0 and the square root of c log n. And then omega n is greater than the square root of c log n. Exploiting the linearity of the expectation operator, we are able to split the expectation into these three expectations. Note that here we have the indicator that omega n is between 0 and the square root of c log n. If omega n is not in this range, then what we have inside the expectation is 0. If omega n is in this range, then what we have inside the expectation is omega n itself, which is non-negative. All in all, this expectation is greater than or equal to 0. Consequently, we can lower bound the sum of these three expectations by the sum of the first and third expectations, because this second expectation is greater than or equal to 0. A lower bound on the expectation of omega n is the expectation of omega n times the indicator that omega n is strictly greater than square root c log n plus expectation of omega n indicator omega n less than zero. We need now to lower bound each of these two expectations. Let's start with this one. If we use a dummy variable of integration x, this expectation is the integral from minus infinity to infinity x indicator of x less than zero than the pdf of x dx. We can remove this indicator and integrate from minus infinity to zero. What is the BDF of the maximum? The CDF of the maximum evaluated at alpha is the probability that the maximum is less than or equal to alpha. And if the maximum of n random variables is less than or equal to alpha, then each one of them is less than or equal to alpha. Because those random variables here are iid, this joint probability is simply the probability that x1 is less than or equal to alpha raised to the power n. So what is the BDF of the maximum? We need to differentiate this CDF with respect to alpha. So we get n times the probability of x1 less than or equal to alpha to the power n minus 1. And then we need to apply the chain rule and differentiate the CDF of x1 with respect to alpha. So that's the BDF of x1 at alpha. And x1 is a standard Gaussian random variable. And this is its PDF written using the dummy variable of integration x. Because of the symmetry of the standard Gaussian PDF, the probability that x1 is less than or equal to small x, which is negative, is equal to the probability that x1 is greater than minus x. We can use greater than or greater than or equal to. It won't matter because we are dealing with an absolutely continuous random variable. This is the complementary CDF of the random variable x1. And the complementary CDF of the Gaussian random variable is the Q function. Q of beta is the probability that a standard Gaussian random variable is greater than or equal to beta. And this is given by 1 over square root 2 pi, integral from beta to infinity, e to the minus b squared over 2 dv. This is what we have here with beta replaced by minus x. If we go back to our expectation, it is written using this integral. We do a change of variables, y is equal to minus x. And doing this, we have an integration from 0 to infinity. We can take the constants outside. And the integrand now is y times e to the minus half y squared, q of y raised to the power n minus 1. Recall that our goal is to obtain a lower bound on this expectation. Because we have a minus sign here, then to lower bound this quantity, we need an upper bound on the Q function. For the upper bound on the Q function, we use the Chernoff bound. Q of Y is the probability that X1 is greater than Y. Multiply both sides of this inequality by the strictly positive real number rho. The event is exactly the same. The probability remains the same. The exponential function is strictly increasing, so we can exponentiate both sides, and the probability is also the same. Now, we have here a positive random variable. x1 itself is Gaussian. It can be positive or negative, but e to the row x1 is strictly positive. So we can apply Markov inequality, the probability of positive random variable z greater than epsilon. This is upper bounded by the expectation of z divided by epsilon, which is a positive real number. 
if we apply the Markov inequality here, this probability is upper bounded by the expectation of e to the row x1 divided by e to the row y. This is e to the minus row y. We have seen this expectation before. It's the moment generating function of x1 and is given by e to the power row squared divided by 2. This is an upper bound on the q function and it is valid for any row. So we can obtain the least upper bound by minimizing this with respect to rho. We can minimize the exponent, which is a quadratic function in rho, and the minimum is obtained when rho is equal to y. Q of y is less than or equal to e to the minus y squared divided by 2. We can raise both sides to the power n minus 1. So Q of y to the n minus 1 is less than or equal to e to the minus 1 half times n minus 1 times y squared. If we multiply both sides by minus 1, we get this lower bound on the negative of the Q function raised to the power n minus 1. And this is what we use here to obtain a lower bound on this expectation. After inserting the lower bound, this is the integrand. We evaluate this to obtain the constant minus 1 over the square root of 2 pi. This expectation here is greater than or equal to minus 1 over the square root of 2 pi. How can we lower bound this expectation? The Q function, Q of X, is lower bounded by the standard Gaussian PDF times X divided by X squared plus 1. To prove this, start with Q of X multiplied by 1 plus 1 over X squared. Write down Q of X explicitly as 1 over square root 2 pi times the integral of E to the minus V squared divided by 2 dV, and we integrate from X to infinity. In this integration here, the dummy variable of integration v is greater than or equal to x. This means that 1 over v squared is less than or equal to 1 over x squared. Thus, 1 plus 1 over x squared is superior to 1 plus 1 over v squared. We can lower bound this side by 1 over square root 2 pi, and then the same integral, but with 1 plus 1 over x squared replaced by 1 plus 1 over v squared. What is the derivative with respect to v of minus 1 over v times e to the minus v squared over 2. This is 1 over v squared times the exponential minus 1 over v times the exponential. And by the chain rule, we need to differentiate this with respect to v. And the derivative is minus v. Taking the exponential as a common factor, we have 1 over v squared plus v over v, which is 1. This is exactly the integrand that we have here. This means that the value of this integral is 1 over square root 2 pi times this function evaluated at x. Note that this function tends to 0 as v tends to infinity. The conclusion is that x squared plus 1 over x squared q of x is greater than or equal to the Gaussian PDF times 1 over x. Multiply both sides by x squared over x squared plus 1 to obtain the desired lower bound on the q function. We employ this lower bound to lower bound this expectation. Note that omega n, which is the maximum of the random variables from x1 to xn, omega n times the indicator of this event, omega n strictly greater than the square root of c log n, this left-hand side is greater than or equal to the square root of c log n times the indicator. If this condition is not true, both indicators are equal to 0, and we have 0 greater than or equal to 0. If this condition is true, then we have omega n greater than the square root of c log n, which implies that omega n is greater than or equal to the square root of c log n. So this inequality is valid. We can take the expectation of both sides to obtain a lower bound on this expectation as expectation of this constant, the square root of c log n times the indicator. This is a constant that can be taken outside the expectation. Then we have the expectation of an indicator, which is a Bernoulli random variable. This expectation is the probability that this event is true. Our lower bound on this expectation is the square root of C log n times the probability that the maximum is greater than the square root of C log n. This probability is 1 minus the probability that the maximum is less than or equal to the square root of C log n. This is the CDF of the maximum. If the maximum is less than or equal to something, then all the random variables are less than or equal to the same threshold. And because our random variables are IID, this probability here is the probability that X1 is less than or equal to square root C log N raised to the power N.
this probability can be written as one minus the probability of the event x1 superior to the square root of c log n. That's the complementary CDF of the standard Gaussian random variable x1. This is exactly the Q function evaluated at the square root of C log n. We have established this lower bound on the Q function. Replace x by the square root of C log n. The exponential becomes e to the minus half C log n, which is e to the power log of n to the power minus C over 2. This is n to the power minus C over 2. Multiply both sides by minus 1, so the inequality is reversed. Then add 1. For every real number gamma, 1 minus gamma is less than or equal to e to the minus gamma. So the right-hand side here can be upper bounded by e to the minus 1 over square root 2 pi, square root c log n over c log n plus 1, n to the minus c over 2. Raise this side and that side to the power n. When we do this, this term here becomes n to the power 1 minus c over 2. Don't forget that c is a strictly positive real number that is strictly less than 2. Multiply both sides of this inequality by minus 1, so the inequality is reversed. And then add 1. From the previous page, we have that this expectation is greater than or equal to the square root of c log n times the probability that omega n is greater than the square root of c log n. And this probability is this left-hand side that we have in this inequality. The expectation is greater than or equal to the square root of c log n times this quantity here. Now, let's combine all our results. We have obtained the following. Square root 2 log n is greater than or equal to the expectation of omega n, which is the maximum of the n ILD standard Gaussian random variables. This expectation is greater than or equal to the expectation of omega n times the indicator that omega n is greater than the square root of c log n plus the expectation of omega n times the indicator that omega n is less than 0. The lower bound on this expectation is minus 1 over square root 2 by. And the lower bound on this expectation is what we see here. Divide the three sides by the square root of 2 log n. The expectation over the square root of 2 log n is less than or equal to 1. On the left-hand side, we have minus 1 over square root 2 by divided by the square root of 2 log n. So we get this term. And then we have this lower bound here with square root c log n divided by the square root of 2 log n. This will give us this factor, square root of c divided by 2. If we take the limit as n tends to infinity, the right-hand side remains 1. What about the left-hand side? This term here will go to 0 as n tends to infinity because we have square root log n in the denominator. Note that for any c that is strictly less than 2, the power that we have here is strictly positive. n to any strictly positive power grows asymptotically faster than the logarithm or the square root of the logarithm. This exponent here tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. Thus, the exponential tends to zero as n tends to infinity. The left-hand side approaches the square root of c over 2 as n tends to infinity. The claim now is that this limit of interest does exist and is exactly equal to 1. The reason for this is that on the left-hand side, we have c, and c can be made arbitrarily close to 2. Can it be that this limit is equal to some eta that is strictly less than 1? The answer is no, because we can choose c to be greater than 2 eta squared, and of course, less than 2. Then c over 2 is greater than eta squared. Then the square root of c over 2 is greater than eta. This limit cannot be equal to eta, because this limit for every c in this range is greater than or equal to the square root of c over 2. The limit of the expectation of the maximum divided by the square root of 2 log n is equal to 1. The last important point is, why not c equal to from the beginning. And the answer is to go back here. We have in the exponential square root c log n divided by c log n plus 1. Note that as n tends to infinity, this approaches 0. Then we have n to the 1 minus c over 2. If c is equal to 2, then this term here will disappear. And if it disappears, then the exponent tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. The exponential tends to 1 and this bracket tends to zero. Our lower bound here will be zero. We would fail to prove that this limit is exactly equal to one. The idea is to have this positive power of n and to exploit the fact that if beta is greater than zero, x to the power beta divided by log x 
if x tends to infinity, we are in an infinity over infinity situation. By L'Hopital's rule, this limit is equal to the limit of the ratio of the first derivatives with respect to x. Upstairs, we have beta, x to the beta minus 1. Downstairs, we have 1 over x. This is the limit as x tends to infinity of beta, x to the power beta. And this is infinity when beta is a strictly positive power. To make sure that the lower bound can be made arbitrarily close to 1, we need this positive power here. That's the reason we have worked with C that can be made arbitrarily close to 2, but is not exactly equal to 2.